Hello and welcome to One on One on Plus TV Africa. I am Elsie Godwin. On this episode, we are one on one with an elder statesman, an accomplished engineer, broadcaster, pastor, and a former director general of the Nigerian Television Authority, Pashengo Wigwe. Thank, Thank you, you very, so much for your time. Sir. Thank you very much. Sir. All right, so it's my pleasure okay. to be here. Just celebrated 59 years of independence. So, where were you when we gained independence? I was in Britain. Actually, I was at the BBC when we had independence. Okay. And I watched the, the, uh, the, the transition on the television. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that was what it was. I, I wasn't in Nigeria then. I was a young man, mm -hmm. just still continuing my studies. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how did you celebrate? Was it a thing of pride for you at the time? Well, pride, I wouldn't say it was a thing of pride. We were merely changing from one stage to the other. I didn't know what the future had in stock for us. Mm -hmm. My concern then was to get myself accomplished, to see how I fit into the whole system. Mm. That was how I felt at that point in time, because I didn't know the implication. I was such a young man. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what would you say the implications have been so far? Yeah, the implication later on I got to realize is that now we took we took on our destiny into our hands, mm. and uh, what, we would, what we make of it will depend entirely on us. Well, we've seen the development, we've seen the transformation from 1960, 61 to 70, 71, 80, 81. I think it's there for all to see. Mm. Yes. So what would you say we've achieved? Have we achieved the purpose of Nigeria, or we are still lacking behind? I think we are just growing. We are just growing. We haven't attained it yet. Mm -hmm. We are just growing. Because I remember at that time, as soon as we finished school, most of us were itching to come back to Nigeria. For those of us who were youth then, we saw it as an opportunity of stepping into the shoes that the expatriates were going to leave behind. Because you saw them in the offices, you saw, like we, the engineers, you saw your chief engineer, you saw your senior engineers, expatriates, you saw them, and you had made those positions, and then you are spared to get to those positions. So we saw that those positions were ours, you know, just if we did some hard work, if we had some hard work, we'd mm. get there. That was how we saw it then. We didn't see the political implications then. So in growing, you said Nigeria is growing. Some would say we are retrogressing at this point. Would you say we are garnering momentum or we're just really going backwards? I would say we're growing, but for some of us, I don't know, maybe we're impatient. We don't think we are growing as fast as we should. Okay. Particularly so when you look at other countries that we could, we probably have said that we're in the same position as we were at that point in time. So would, some of us would think we're not growing as fast as we should. Um, when you check the rate, of great, uh, the, rate, uh, the rate of growth as soon as we had independence, it was fast. Maybe it was not unexpected because you would see that a lot of us were gaining scholarships to go and read and it was a thing of joy for us. But those scholarships are not coming that fast now as mm -hmm. they used to. I think it's natural. Rate of growth will change with time. Mm -hmm. Are you one of those who believe Nigeria should have stayed with the parliamentary um, way of government than what we have now? Well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that the, 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 the amount of money you spend in parliamentary system is not as high. Okay. as in the presidential system. And uh, then the prime minister did not wield as much power as the president now, was quite a lot under control. And so um, if you had a president that needed or a prime minister that needed control, that was the best system. But if you had a prime minister that, you know, does not get intoxicated with power, all right? Presidential system is good. Because, you see, for presidential system, one thing you will notice is that you have, you have the control that is built in. You have, for instance, the, judge, the, the judiciary, and then you have the parliamentary, you know, the, the, the assembly. 
But then, uh, from our experiences, it is possible for the president to really get these people under control. Mm -hmm. Yes. But if really those people have their, you know, their, they're able to exercise the powers which are, you know, supposed to own as a result of the constitution, then presidential system is very good. But the expenses of running the presidential system is great. Hmm. Whereas with the parliamentary system, and the parliamentary system, the prime minister is very well under control. I'm, see, I'm seeing what is happening in Britain. We're watching. We're watching. And you see, much as the, press, the prime minister will want to move the way he will want to move, you find the assembly is holding him under check. Mm -hmm. He cannot move that fast. But which yeah. one would you choose, naturally? Right now. Mm, for Nigeria, Nigeria, looking at Nigeria, the state of I the nation. I think I want the, pre, pre, uh, the parliamentary system. Parliamentary system. Yeah, the prime minister, the president or prime minister will be strictly under control. Mm. Okay, talking about the cost of running the government now, yes. because some will say, you're saying we are... Nigeria is broke, yeah. but the cost of running this government is really high. Yes. Is there anything that can be done right now to salvage the situation? You want to cut perhaps the salary of the senators and people in the National Assembly? Apart from cutting their salary, unless, of course, you want to make them, you know, uh, not full time. Mm -hmm. No. Perhaps when you look at these two options, Maybe if you make them part-time, that would help considerably. But if you make them part-time, whether they'll be able to f fulfill the purposes for which they are there, would be another challenge. Mm. Yes. Unless, of course, if you make them full-time, and then they agree on their own to now cut down the salaries which they are earning, that may help. But then when you consider that you have 36 governors, mm. You have state houses of assembly. It is quite a challenge. Mm. It's quite a challenge. Now, looking at the cost of running the government, that aside, yes. and then looking at how it seems like our politicians are becoming power hungry, yes. would you say switching back to parliamentary should be on the table? I think they should consider it. They should really talk about them. Mm -hmm. And they'll be able to get, you know, they get some truths out of them. Because when they talk about them, they will see the pros and the cons of both of them. And they should be able to take a decision in the interest of the nation. Mm. Yes. Because if we get broke, it's going to be something very serious, really. If we get broke, there'll be anarchy. Mm. Because when a country becomes totally poor, particularly at that time, haven't tested the wealth, it becomes difficult. You know, when we hadn't tested well, that Nigeria was what it was, it was easy for us. We, we, we had adjusted to poverty, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to say. So, but having tested wealth, and you now get broke, it's a bit dangerous. Mm. Yes. So we have to be very careful. All right, let's go for a very quick break. But when we come back, we'll definitely continue this conversation with Spa. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Plus TV Africa, and we're one-on-one -on -one with Pashingo Wigwe. Okay, so um, talking about the country and where we are now, and then some are talking about diversification, some are talking about being marginalized. Do you think the conversation about Biafra and IPOB should be considered or even tolerated at this time? We're not talking about toler being tolerated or not being tolerated. Mm -hmm. You see, when people do make such agitations, they're expressing their minds. Mm -hmm. So all you re actually require is a fair-minded head to ensure that things are evenly distributed. Now, when you talk about agitation of people like Biafra and all that type of thing, it had not been there all along. If you have a fair-minded head of state and you have an inclusive government, mm -hmm. those agitations will immediately drop. Okay. That's what I think. That's what I believe. So you think, do you think this government has not been inclusive enough? Uh, at, a, at a point in time, they didn't appear to be inclusive, but I can see a lot of improvement coming up. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of improvement at this point in time. Yes. 
At what point did you start noticing this improvement? Because in July, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're part of the Christian Elders, um, under the National Christian Elders Forum, yes. and recently wrote to the British Parliament on alleged Buhari secret agenda. So um, you were mentioned as a member of this forum. Why do you think that letter was necessary? I can't remember that letter exactly. Okay. I can't remember that exactly. But you know what had happened during the first time? We had a situation where uh, ministers were coming from a particular area of the country. The second time, there was a lot of difference. Appointments. You know, a lot of other people were being included. Mm. Yes. This second time, as at now, I was telling somebody yesterday, I noticed some improvement in security. And if it continues this way, agitations will stop. I believe it. If you have a chance to advise Mr. President now, yes, what yes. would you say to him? You know, he should run an open government, inclusive government, mm -hmm. let the National Assembly have a free hand, let the judiciary have a free hand, independent hand, so that if at any point in time you think you have been marginalized or whatever reason you, 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 you have for taking up any matter, mm -hmm. you know that at least you have a neutral party that will look at it mm -hmm. and give you justice. Mm. Yes. But so far, looking at the cases we have on ground in the court of law, would you say the judiciary is being open-minded or running on a free hand? What cases are you having in mind? Okay, so we have the one for Shawore, which is the latest one. Uh, the Shawore case. Mm -hmm. The Shawore case, I think, is a bit touchy. I think um, once the court has made a pronouncement, we should abide by the rule of law. Okay. Yes, because they say the rule of man is very dangerous. Hmm. The court has made a pronouncement. Let's abide by the rule of law. All right. So um, taking it back to education, people say the dumping down of our education is one of the things that have caused um, our failure, quote and unquote. Um, I know some will say Nigeria is growing. We have not failed. It's still a process. But would you say there is? problem in the education sector in Nigeria? I think there is a problem in the education sector. In the education sector, the education sector has to be competitive. It must, if we must be challenging the world, if we mm. must move further. Challenging in the sense that you don't, if a particular part of the country is down, mm -hmm. you don't pull down the rest of the country. All you do is to build up the part that is down so that they compete with the other areas that are up. For instance, um, making a cut-off point into secondary schools, you know, different from state to state, I don't think is the best way to approach it. Okay. Because take, for instance, you look at a family. If you find a child that is very brilliant, the other one is not doing too well, what you do is to focus on the one that is not doing too well, pull him up so that he'll be doing well. Then, of course, you'll be in a position to attain a higher standard. But if you now do it in such a way that sometimes, you know, the, the very brilliant ones are denied the admission because you want to create room for, the, for those who are not that bright, clearly what you are doing is to just create room for mediocrity. Mm. Yes. So okay. for, for that reason, I believe the education system, our education system has dropped considerably. Our mm. education needs standards have dropped considerably. It wasn't so. When we face challenges outside, in the days of old, Nigerians were very bright. Even though we have a few stars out, but it's not as you know uh, as uh, uh, as we used to have it in those days. You know, had good, good. For instance, if you became a graduate from Ibadan, talking about the 60s and the 70s, mm -hmm. you competed very well with people from Cambridge and Oxford. Hmm. So, when would you say this standard dropped? Uh, the standard dropped when we started discrimination, in, you know, in admission, as you know, based on the state you are coming from. Hmm. That was when the standard started dropping. You weren't encouraging, you know, people to work diligently to attain that standard. Rather, you were discouraging those who were having very high standards, so that they, those 
you know, the, 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 the poor ones who are able to get in. Mm. It's not good. Okay, in talking about education, there are um, varying opinions. Some tell you that education is really expensive, yes. and at this stage, if we want quality education, then we should not expect free education. Yes. Do you agree with that um, point of view? Um, well, you have to have an idea of what money we make really. Mm -hmm. Education is expensive, but we know that um, um, illiteracy is worse than uh, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't want to try literacy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we'll do everything to make sure our education is at the best we can get in this country. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, let's talk about broadcasting. You were DG at the NTA. What was it like at the time when you were DG? Mm, I was DG at the NTA. At that time, we still had military government. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a democracy. Um, it was a lot different. It was... Even on that, we, we, we had some freedom as well. Journalism, you know, is very risky. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know you have embarked on it. Uh, particularly when you sit where I'm sitting and say what I'm saying. But then if I say what I'm saying and you broadcast what they expect you not to broadcast, you are in trouble as well. Mm. So you see, at, particularly so when the, 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 the government is paying the, is big, is the one that is paying the piper. And that is why, in fact, uh, now that you have private television stations like this one, you have the type of freedom that NTA doesn't enjoy. Do we really have the freedom? To some extent, you have the freedom that, mm. that NTA, NTA would never have. You see, and let me tell you, those who will not allow the freedom, those who will not allow the freedom in their own system, enjoy this freedom because, you see, they run to you to use, to use you in very many occasions, because, because they, they, they have NTA in their chains, they have the government organs in their chains, mm -hmm. viewers you know, prefer you know, the, the, the private setup mm -hmm. because you are freer, you broadcast what NTA cannot broadcast. Okay. Yes, so you find that NTA at that particular point in time uh, was virtually the sole organization. They, had, they didn't have all that freedom. They were in chains. Hmm. They were in chains to a very large extent. Okay. Yes. So you don't want me to be specific. No. Oh, well, you I'll, I'll be glad if you can be specific. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess you don't want me to be specific at this point in time hmm. because uh, uh, I would remember on a particular occasion I was stopped from broadcasting a particular a particular issue. In fact, the event took place. I was there on my way to my house. I got a telephone call. That tape must not see the light of day. But then the news chaps have taken the thing to the studio. To save my head, I had to go to the station. Can I have that tape? I took the tape and went and locked it up in my house. Mm. You can see what I'm talking about. It was as bad as that. Okay, so um, looking at journalism of then and now, would you say that journalists are doing enough, considering that you say they have a level of freedom that the NTA don't have? Are they doing enough in the society? Uh, within limits. Mm -hmm. They're not doing enough because they too, they are doing self-censorship. They're ensuring that uh, they don't have their neck in the gallows. I'm not doing enough mm -hmm. because journalists, if you think they're doing enough, how, how many of them have spoken about the young man that the court has set free, but then the government is holding him? Mm. There, were, there was a time when journalists were very bold and they would write about it. They would write about it. They would cry about it. You see it on a daily basis. All right, let's go for another break. But when we come back, we'll definitely carry on this conversation. We'll be right back. All right, so comparing NTA that you were part of at the time and the NTA of now, would you yes. say they are the same? They can't be the same. Why not? It's difficult to be the same. But okay, so now, what are the differences? What is happening now? Um... NTA, for instance, my, I gather, 
they got to have fight. As they make their money, they send everything there. It goes through a budget. And uh, when you go through a budget and controlled by people who don't have experience in running the organization, it's like asking an illiterate to lead somebody who is red, mm. a blind to lead, you know. Because you find the situation, broadcasting is very expensive. The type of money you will spend here, it will take NT a lot of struggle to be able to spend, have that money to spend, because the control is from outside. Okay. That's why I think it's, it cannot be the same. Hmm. Uh, the control is now tighter. Here it's difficult for the DG to just go head hunt, because sometimes you need some special staff, you go head hunt. I hear it is not that easy in NTA. At that time, you know, during our days, it was a lot easier. Your board understands immediately because a lot of those members of the board are professionals. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the times differ. Those controlling the system now are different from what it used to be in our time. Mm. As Nigerians, would you say we are losing our values and culture as a people? I think so, because there is a lot of infiltration of Western values into our country. Two, a lot of us are trained abroad, and at a particular point in time when you should really inculcate these values into our people, they are abroad, receiving training. Different culture. Cultures that have been eroded completely from what they used to be. Hmm. Because in our days, for instance, I would say our culture was very much akin to the culture in Britain. What was bad here was the, most of them were bad there. But you can see that dichotomy now all over the place. Mm. So I think um, there is some bit of erosion of our culture, our values, as a result of incursion of Western you know, culture into this place. Have you seen the news on the Cess for Grade documentary? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Okay, so what has happened to Christendom? Because we've had a um, series of accusations. Yes. Pointing to people that are supposed to be the ones we look up to when we want to talk about morals. Right. You know, so where did we get it wrong? Why are we having this type of fingers being pointed at this set of people? Mm. You seem to have dropped into our conversation yesterday. We are chatting and talking about what has happened to our values, erosion into our culture, and the sex for greed, which has now gone into the universities and all that. Time. Now, I think, I think something has gone wrong all around including the churches, mm. those who should be upholding this, those who should be speaking to authorities where they go wrong, those who should be talking to the people where they go wrong. And uh, what has also happened is the fact that most people don't even believe in what they preach anymore. Mm. Then you begin to ask, is there anything they know about the faith that you don't know? Why is it that they, become, they have become hypocrites? They preach one thing and do something else. But still, there are good ones. Mm -hmm. And this is why, uh, but what has happened is that the bad ones are far, you know, they are having more impact. People want to go to them rather than stay with the good ones. You see, it's like you have, there are certain things which churches preach. And you say, these people are hypocrites. I will not go to this church. See what they are asking. You have a choice of the church you go to or the mosque you go to. You have a choice, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that choice is purely dependent on what you hear there. Sometimes they are very hard on you. You say you won't go there again. Doesn't it happen? Haven't you rejected certain churches based on the fact that you think they're very hard? Mm -hmm. This is what is happening. People are not compelled, they make their choices where they go to. And because you have the bad ones, the people who don't even care how the ladies appear, people who don't care how the men appear, 
the previous one. So some people are settled with those ones. But you come to the one that is very critical, people don't want to go there. Hmm. But is this about um, appearance and the teachings now? Appearance, teachings, all right? Mm -hmm. Appearance, because you can't rule out appearance. Because if Dr. Boniface, for example, was a pastor in Foursquare, and I don't think Foursquare can be categorized as that kind of um, gathering that condoned any kind of appearance. Right. But yes. there was a bad egg. Jesus had 12 disciples, and mm. there was a Judas. There was a Judas. Mm -hmm. So even in the best of churches, the only time you will have the ideal church is when we get there. Mm. But right here, you have a good church, very big church, at that end of that same church where they are preaching the sound of gospel. So somebody is preaching something else. Mm. This is what happens. Is there anything that can be done? Well, what is it that can be done? What it is that can be done is, is tough, it's tough. It is a tough situation because there is no way you can, you can, it's only God that can really control the situation perfectly. Every human endeavor must have one fault or the other. Preach as much as you can. In fact, sometimes even the bad ones are less, but you see, they exercise, they, people love them, they love them more than they love the, 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 the good ones because of what they hear. So the only thing is, if you excommunicate them, they go and start their own church, people will still flock to them. Hmm. Okay, so um, our time is almost over. But before I let you go, um, family life, you're 85, and you have children, grandchildren, yes. great grandchildren. Yes. How does it feel to achieve all this at this age now? Mm. I give thanks to God every day. First thing I do every day, give me so much joy. Mm. And just a few weeks ago, with my grandchildren, big grandchildren, they were thrilling me outside this country on a holiday. Mm. It was such a joy to me. My only prayer is that as they grow, may they make a difference wherever they are. May they not join the flock mm. because <laughs> at the point in time, even right now, they are completely out of your control. So you just have to pray that if uh, that which you have built into them, that they will live by it and make an impact in society, whatever they are, they are, they are, they are, they are led to stay. Do you think people still care about family values? Most people don't. Most people don't. Hmm. I think most people don't. And that is the pity of it all. And that is why we are derailing. If most people would care, they will, they will wonder, they will, they, will, they, will, they will want to know what their children do, particularly at those impressionable ages, the time, the period they are in secondary schools, right from their youth to that time. People will follow closely. But again, the values of the external world has influenced us so much. You, in my days, if your child moved out there and did what you don't expect him to do or had to do, your neighbor would correct that child and report the child to you. In our days, if my father told me, I'm going to tell you how to your headmaster this year, I'd be scared, Steve. It's not so. If anybody touches my child outside now, I'll go to court. Mm. So you find that the system is completely disrupted. Children don't get the type of control they should get, particularly at the impressionable age, to build into them the type of values they should live along with till they die. All right. Thank you so much, sir. It's been a pleasure and an honor chatting with you. It is my joy to be here. Right. We've been speaking with Elder Statesman Pa Shengul Wigwe and he's touched on politics, family values and even the Christendom. Um, thank you for watching and you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel, A Plus TV Africa, to catch up on interesting conversations such as this one. My name is Elsie Godwin. See you later.